And so I started looking for roles which would involve some aspect of communication. Um, and I found medical affairs. And so in medical affairs, there's like a lot of different things that you do, but there's also a sales supporting role called a medical science liaison. And so this person essentially has the technical information, so has the technical knowledge, and um, but is not a salesperson, is not a drug sales rep. Okay, um, hello and welcome uh, to the PhD talk show by Biopatrika. I am Shiny, your host for today's session. And today we have Dr. Charu Gupta joining uh, here with us. Um, so Charu works as a technical information scientist at the Jackson Laboratory. Um, I know many of you would be really uh, excited to know more about this role and believe me, so am I. So uh, without any further ado, let's like get started. Um, so excited charu yeah absolutely thanks for having me on the talk show yeah yeah the pleasure is ours um so to start with uh, charu uh, we would definitely love to hear about your uh, journey so far where you come from and your entire academic and career journey that you've endured yeah so um it's been a very long journey as is the case with more most PhDs. Um, maybe mine is a little bit shorter than some. But um, so I grew up in India and um, I did all of my schooling up till my master's from India. Um, so I have a bachelor's in biotechnology. So that's engineering. I have a, I have a master's in engineering as well um, uh, in bioscience and bioengineering. And um, those I did in India. And then I applied for um, the TAFR NCBS PhD exam. And I did not get in. And that is the only catalyst that made me I was like, okay, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll apply for like these European programs and uh, programs outside in US. So I got into one of them. I did my PhD in Germany um, at the Hanover Biomedical School. And I studied, uh, it, it was a very translational lab. So that was my one of my first experiences with actually being in the clinic. And um, so that's basically like how my journey went and then I did a postdoc there I did a postdoc at University of Michigan um, before coming into uh, this current role as a technical information scientist okay um, that's that's really uh, good to hear like uh, all starting from your bachelor's master's and how you did a PhD and then um, finally you ended up you also did a postdoc and then ended up in your current role um so yeah in that line like uh, um how did you exactly end up in your current role like um, because uh, from the term which is like a technical information scientist it is not a very conventional role which people usually do uh, after a phd or a postdoc so i'm really really curious and i think i'll just straight away ask you like if you can uh, walk us through this journey how did you get this role and yeah uh, absolutely um it's it's a bit of a convoluted story because it started out with like I was looking for jobs I moved to US after I got married um, and uh, it was like towards when um, there was like a heavy amount of COVID um, there were people were getting laid off there weren't like so many jobs labs weren't open um, and uh, I did not have a work visa as well so that was sort of like a very complicated time to get into things but it did give me some time to think about what I wanted to do um and fun fact i also work for biopatrika um and they uh, like biopatrika gave me the opportunity to explore scientific communication and to really talk to people and i found that really nice like i like talking to people anyway but like in a scientific fashion um in the in terms of like presenting myself and uh talking a little bit more as opposed to just like the traditional writing which we as scientists are are really good at but you know, the casual conversations which you can have with everyone. That's a that's a skill that like we academicians generally don't have. And um, so that was a skill. I was like, this is fun. This is this is interesting. And this can actually help me reach more people. And so I started looking for roles which would involve some aspect of communication. Um, and I found medical affairs. And so in medical affairs, there's like a lot of different things that you do, but there's also a sales supporting role called a medical science liaison. And so this person essentially has 
the technical information, so has the technical knowledge, and um, but is not a salesperson, is not a drug sales rep. Uh, this is a person who goes to the clinic, who goes to the scientists, who like kind of takes voice of customer here and there and understands things. And I was like, this makes a lot of sense because like, I'm I'm not sure. I, like at that point, I was like, I don't have sales experience. I don't have business experience, but I have science experience. I can understand through my translational PhD and postdocs, um, I can understand what scientists are saying. And I can also speak the language that clinicians are speaking. Um, so eventually like, that did not work out. However, what I got out of it was a um, certification. Um, so I'm board certified to be an MSL, um, medical science liaison, MSL. Um, but uh, so that kind of like gave me a little bit of a leverage when talking about medical affairs. Um, I scored an internship at an up and coming CAR T cell company. It's called Med Therapy Biotech. And that was like, I, I have to give this, like it was one of my friends who kind of recommended me and like things worked out. And I wrote a couple of white papers for them. I sat on PR meetings um, and it just like sort of felt like I was really interested in communication and the science and like aspects of marketing and sales. So like that seems like very con it, it, it's, it's a little bit of like a mixed pot. It's a very confusing place to be in. Um, but while I was searching for roles, I found that the Jackson Laboratory had listed technical information scientists, and in my mind, technical information went to ID. Um, so like information technology, which it completely is not. So how I can describe it a little bit is um, the audience might be familiar with something, uh, some uh, a role called field application scientist. So those are people who probably like have PhDs have come to your laboratory, for example, um, to demonstrate chemi docs or uh, flow cytometers and like help you troubleshoot experiments and like those sort of things. So if you combine that field application scientist role with like a heavy consultancy and uh, have like uh, an aspect of education and communication, that's what I do. So this, this is the role that I was like, this is perfect. This makes sense. This is what I want to do. Um, so I found a person who was a TIS and um, I was like, hey, can you talk to me? And that's really how I did most of my networking um, and built my network on LinkedIn. I would just message people and be like, I love what you do. So like, you know, like how we are talking today, it's like, this is really interesting. Like, can we do a 20 minute phone call? And you like everyone can do that personally as well. Um, and this person agreed. And uh, somehow he convinced me. He was like, yes, you have to apply for it. And I did. Uh, but let's go back to the part where like, I don't have a work visa. So I'm sitting there waiting for, so the, the whole like hiring process and companies is usually pretty exhausting. It takes a long time. And like, I, I'm not a patient person. And I had been like on the sidelines for over a year, I think almost two years. And I was just tired. So I was doing things on the side, like I was doing meth therapy and biopatrika, but like, you know, you, you want to get paid as well. <laughs> so um, I found my postdoc at University of Michigan. They said yes, within the day. And um, I, I went there, they did my visa and everything. And then Jackson Lab came back and they were like, let's, let's talk to the hiring manager. And I'm like, sorry, I already took a job. But my uh, manager... Uh, the hiring manager then and my manager now are the same. And she was like, okay, let me know if you were interested ever in the future. And um, I said, sure. Like, I mean, who goes back, right? But I think like uh, maybe six months into my postdoc, I wrote to my manager and I was like, this is going to sound like a really weird email. However, I think I'm ready to put my lab coat down. And she wrote back almost immediately saying, I know the feeling. And uh, it, it it just like, that's how it progressed. It was like almost, uh, I think 11 months later that she uh, was like, I have a role, if you're interested, we'll just set up the interviews. And everything happened super quickly. Um, at, at that point, because like we'd been, you know, this, this thing was in, uh, in the whole process for like over a year. And uh, Eventually, it did work out, uh, and here I am <laughs> in this role. So sometimes I like the one 
key takeaway that I had was like really rely on your network. And um, I will say like talking to people really helps and don't burn bridges with anyone. <laughs> No, um, I, I think uh, like I totally agree with that. Like building networks, relying on networks and not burning bridges is absolutely um, needed. And especially with the current job market, which is out here, um, it's, it's a very, very difficult path um, to find even like something which you would have thought or I would have thought like three or four years ago is like an easy way to get into a job. Now it's like way difficult. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, yeah. So that is when I think connections come uh, handy and uh, they really help. So um, yeah. yeah, but uh, no. So one thing which I um, got out of what you just mentioned is that um things happen which has to happen so I mean like this has been there for a while you said like you have yes. been waiting and then because of your um, because of a complicated visa situation which we'll get into mm -hmm. in our next uh, question but um, you had to wait and then finally get into a yeah. postdoc and but then eventually you are uh, in the place where you were meant to be so um, yeah. yeah I'm a scientist but I completely believe in manifestation <laughs> No, I, I do so. So I I, I think uh, um, it's weird, um, ironic, but I mean, like, I, I truly, truly believe in um, all, all of these, um, you know, like manifestations as well as um, the right time for the right thing to happen. So mm -hmm. no matter yeah. how hard you try, uh, but it won't happen if it's not the right time. So yeah. Um, it has happened to me and I, I like so believe in it so no yeah, thanks for sharing is critical. that <laughs> <laughs> exactly um, so yeah I mean like getting back to the visa thing as I was telling uh, so you mentioned you came uh, to the US uh, like from Germany so what was the visa that you came on uh, like when you just moved to US like uh, yeah I, I can walk you through my visa process so I had a B1 B2 which is a tourist business visa because I'd been here previously um for a conference and uh so when I got married we tried to get like the dependent H4 visa but like it didn't really work out because the embassies were closed and everything was like that's okay. I'll just go there and then I'll find a job and it'll be so easy. But it really is not. I, I, I will be honest here. Like I really want to caution people. And like I've had a lot of people reach out who are like, we want to do our PhDs in US. I'm like, come prepared. Come prepared to like that 90% of the people don't get things worked out in their favor. Um, so don't be super disappointed if it doesn't work out. It's just the system. It's not you. And um. There's really nothing you can do to change it, right? Because the it, it's not in our power. Um, I guess what's in our power is that when we eventually become scientists or have labs or like are in those hiring positions, uh, we should be a little bit more conscious of uh, where people are coming from, how to help them best. That's the only thing that we can do from our end. And we can try that, but like, well, we can get into it, but there's just a lot of, politics and processes and like HR things that happen when you work as well. Um, but I came here on a B1, B2. Uh, they give you like an entry for six months. And uh, I tried to apply for a change of status. It was very unclear if like when I have the receipt, can I stay here? Do I have to go back? And I was like, I don't want to accumulate unlawful status because it's like from a tourist to like a dependent visa. So I went back home and like the wait times were crazy. So I, I went back home, I think um, in July of 2021 and I had my appointment for a visa in like somewhere in 2022. And, you know, I'm newly married. So it's like, <laughs> do I really want to stay, you know, apart from my husband for that long? It it also like takes a toll on your relationship and you it's it's really difficult because like you're living with someone for the first time. So like there's a lot of adjustment that's happening on the personal front as well. And there's a lot of disappointment, right? Because like you, I did come as like a really good scientist and I thought I was the best at what I do. And like, at least I was one of the best at what I do. So it shouldn't have been so hard to get anything. Um, but then, uh, like, I was scouring the internet, 
day and night, like every 10 minutes, I used to refresh the visa page. Um, I did get my appointment in like October of 21. I got my visa stamped. And then like five days later, I was on a plane um, back here. But now I was on a dependent visa. I was like, great, because I can get employment authorization. Um, and just to mention that you can get employment authorization only if your spouse has a green card filed. So again, if your spouse doesn't have a green card filed, you lose. So it's basically just a losing battle. It's like, you know, who loses first? It's it's just like, how do you have this check? Do you have this? No, get out of line. Um, so it's a little bit like that. And then I was like, yes, so I can apply for an EAD, which means um, that you have your own employment authorization. And then, yes, you can be considered for jobs in companies such as Pfizer, Amgen, like, you know, those, those sort of like um, roles. And you you can also do your own business. You can run your own LLC and stuff. So it's, it's basically like a green card, but it's also a little bit dependent on someone else's job. Um, I applied for that and I waited for like, eight, six to eight months, nothing, no word. People, there were some people who were getting there and I was on all on those groups where everyone's like, yeah, I got my EAD in three months. And I was like, I hate you. <laughs> I don't know you, but I don't like you. Um, but like my visa, uh, my EAD application had gone to a center which had a wait time of 13 and a half months. So I eventually was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to get a job, but I'm going to get a job only if they give me an H-1B. And so I well, I was a scientist. I applied for postdoc positions. I knew that they could give me an H-1B. That's like the research that I had done so far. Whenever I applied for to companies or when I you know, got approached by recruiters and everything, um, the conversations would stop at, oh, we can't do your visa. In fact, like I went as far as talking to the vice president of a company and this person spent like a whole hour talking to me. So like the amount of effort that was put in was a lot, but then it was like, yeah, we don't do immigration. So it, it's it's all very disappointing. It's all very tiresome. And um, at the end of it, it's, it's not an easy process looking for a job, uh, but um, I got... Postdoc offers from um, <clears throat> those were pretty easy to get at that time because uh, people were just starting to hire uh, after the COVID freeze. And then um, there were like a lot of um, people who'd stopped applying because like there were no visas and everything. So there was, there was like quite a bit of space. So you were basically getting a yes from everyone. Um, they, they would offer me J1. J1 is not a good visa to come on. I, I need everyone to understand that because when you finish two years or whatever, you have to go back, get like a no objection from your country. Then you come back and then you shift here and that it's, it is just beyond annoying. It's just a lot more bureaucratic hassle. Um, and then I was like, no, you have to give me an H1B. And I was like, I've waited this long. I want the H1B. And that's about it. Um, so University of Michigan was ready to hire me on an H-1B, uh, which is honestly, like I shouldn't, I shouldn't be disrespectful, but it was a, uh, it, it was a very important criteria in my selection um, of the lab. Uh, the work that they did, like the project that they pitched to me was, was very nice, very interesting. Um, <clears throat> I think there was like a, you know, aspect of me, which was like, um, and I, I will be completely honest here that I maybe I was the one who wanted to sort of use them <laughs> to be like, yeah, let, uh, let's let do the H-1B. And I talked to the professor and I was like, so um, can you do my green card? And they were like, yeah. And like, you know, one and a half, two years, we'll file your green card application and everything. And I was like, great, this works out well. Um, but it it really wasn't what I wanted to do. And so I, I left it. But uh, what they gave me was an H-1B, which was a no lottery H-1B, which is given to exceptional scholars. Um, so you uh, so basically, if you have a PhD, an academic or a nonprofit institution can apply for that, that for you. Uh, the Jackson Laboratory is also a nonprofit. So that's why the transfer was easy. And that's why this was one of the places that would hire me. Um, I did apply to roles, for example, at other CROs, so like Charles River, Innative, uh, Invigo, but they would not. Um, even though like I met 
Charles River representatives at like a career fair. And I was like, you guys did not hire me. And like, why? And they're like, oh, you know, if you apply for the associate scientist position, we'll hire you. And above that, that is not true. It may be in certain cases and it may be for certain people, um, but they normally try to just look for people who have visas. There's also like a lot of jobs which will say, um, we encourage all nationalities and all people to apply. And then they have like a little thing in the bottom that says, um, we will not be sponsoring any immigration. Even like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and I feel like I'm saying something that I can get canceled for <laughs> in the future, but even Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, has a note on some of their things because I was looking for like nonprofits and uh, that they don't sponsor visa they don't intend to sponsor visas for these positions which i think is very unfair for a non-profit yeah i mean like um i um so unfortunately or i don't know what to say but i had come on j1 so i know the drill of yeah. uh, going through j1 and uh, going through all the um no objection certification and not not so basically, you need to return to India after um, like a tenure of five years. So in order to mm -hmm. get a waiver from that, um, so it's a long, long process and a lot of paperwork, which involves both the countries. So uh, it's a headache. So definitely, uh, even I agree that if people has other options, uh, J1 is, I think, should be their least uh, favorable one to take. Um, yeah. The other option should be uh, definitely explored more. So um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I would say if people want to move out of India, go to Europe, go to Australia. I mean, Australia, I think is a little bit more expensive, but go to Europe. They treat you better. They pay you better. Um, you get like health insurance from the government. You don't have to pay for your medical bills, which is like, which was a very surprising thing to me because I'd stayed in Germany for so long. And I was like, I thought the entire Western world took care of healthcare, but doesn't. <laughs> yeah yeah uh no that's that's very true so uh, i mean i'm sure like um our audience has has been given a lot of very good tips um if like people who are in india and are planning to pursue further studies or even like look for jobs or anything outside of india there are many including yes us of course if they have like uh, if they have their spouse or they have some way of getting around with the tricky visa scenario here then okay it's not a bad place to come and work and like um, especially yeah. related to you know stem and basic life sciences uh, there's a lot of pharma and biotech in in the u.s yeah. as compared to many other places so but it definitely yeah. depends on what and, you, yeah exactly and like if you're ready to be patient so if you are okay with accepting that like you will probably never get a green card so you'll never get a permanent residency um then then it's totally fine um it, it is a good opportunity for like people in india who have already published a lot and who've cited a lot because they can apply for their own green card independently um and of course like there, there's a lot of resources there's a whole community to help you yeah yeah absolutely yes uh, no, uh, that's amazing. I mean, like, let's get a little away from the sad and tricky, <laughs> <laughs> which is, I think, a part of every all immigrants um, story, um, mostly Indians, I guess, um, yeah. who has been dealing with uh, some of the other visa related issue Um whatsoever so um anyway so uh, you did speak a little bit uh, very briefly about the role that you are in currently um so how does your like everyday like life at work looks like like starting from the morning like what are the different things that you need to do um yeah um so like i said this role is it's quite dynamic so i have like different types of days um so i'll talk about like when i'm in my home office, 
so I work from home um, and uh, if I'm traveling. So I do travel to support sales. Um, and so when I'm at home, um, my day usually starts with like, I, I like to have my calendar updated and like it, it sounds very like, ooh, so professional, but like you kind of have to when you just like have a lot of um, different engagements. And then I'll, I'll look at like what kind of meetings I have. And I try to keep like the first half an hour. So I work eight to five. I keep the first half an hour free to kind of um, just jot down notes and make my to-do list for the day and like kind of be like, okay, I have to do this, 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 and this. Um, we get, uh, so my team gets a lot of um, email cases where people are basically asking research questions and they're like, it could be as simple as, um, can you help me find a GFP mouse um, to as complicated as help me design the study? Um, and uh, a lot of it can also involve like which products and services do you have that could help us? So we are a contract research organization as well as a repository. So it could be in like, this is a mouse that you could use, or we can run this entire, um, you know, cancer study for you. And these would be the deliverables. And this is how much like, there's a lot of like some uh, aspect of it does involve quoting um, and being part of the sales cycle. Um, so I will like start answering all of these email questions. We get them like three times through an automated system throughout the day, but like you sort of, um, there's, there's a lot of them. Um, I also have, um, office hours, uh, where I am for three hours each day while I'm at home, I'm available via phone. So people can call in. So if you have research questions or um, if you're like, I'm stuck uh, with this mouse or we got this mouse and I'm not able to do genotyping or this is what I'm seeing. Um, I'm not sure if this is the correct thing to do. Um, and also, of course, complaints. It's like you didn't send us the right product. <laughs> so those sort of things um, are what like I'm available throughout the day via email, but three hours via phone. And um, like my team, all we take turns um, for the phone so that like there's always someone if you want to talk to someone, because sometimes it's just easier to talk. Then these are interspersed with uh, what I call like client meetings, which are usually on a video conferencing platform. Um, so client meetings are technically sort of like for scientific engagement. These are a little more advanced where and generally these are either for like a really difficult scientific question so if you're doing like a complex breeding strategy or if you're trying to design a mouse so like model generation um, most of the times the meetings that I do because I have an immuno-oncology background are designing studies so there's a lot of consulting that happens with both academicians as well as pharma and biotech um, and so we design these studies so I have these throughout the day um, on certain days, uh, I host or moderate webinars. So these are educational. Um, on certain days, I will also on the side be working on other educational content. So it could be uh, blogs, presentations. Um, it could be some sort of like tips and tricks, FAQs, those sort of things. Um, and then beyond this, I participate in some product development and innovation meetings, which are sort of interspersed. Um, so we have like metabolic meetings, we have immuno-oncology meetings, we have journal club. So it's a pretty full day. Um, there are various aspects. Uh, there's a lot of meeting and talking to people externally as well as internally. So um, it, it becomes a little taxing on you. I think it's it's not a... I would not say that this is a good role for someone who's an introvert. So um, you like, you know, kind of have to be a go getter and you have to be like the first person to say hello and make people comfortable. Um, you have to be very patient. I was not when I came in, but like they train you and, you know, you learn to like step back and look at things a little differently. It's, it's not like in academia where like every question is like an attack on you. And and that's the like you know that that's how I began when people were like this is not working I'm like you don't know how to do it but like now I'm like they're not attacking me <laughs> it's okay I can step back and like answer the question um so that's what my home office day looks like um I travel quite frequently so I my role involves like thirty percent travel so that's about like a week a month in a way. Um, and so I go to conferences where I'm an invited speaker 
or um, I'm helping uh, helping sales out at the booth with like just doing what I do at home. So like answering research questions, but in person. Um, we present posters. We also like when we go to very large conferences, we help the product managers um, in a way that like we'll walk around, we'll go to sessions, we'll sort of get uh, intel. And like uh, when we're talking to people and like, you know, researchers will tell us, but you don't have this. And we're like, well, what do you want to do? And then we'll talk to them. We'll try to like grasp what they're doing. And then we'll bring back that information like, hey, you know, this person was saying that this could be a really interesting readout. And then we bring it back to our product managers and sort of collect voice of customer. Um, I, I've been invited to speak at uh, national and international conferences. Uh, Jackson Laboratory is a global brand. And like uh, we have offices in like four places in the US and uh, Japan and China, but we have distributors all over the world. So like we often go to say Europe or India or Singapore and uh, we kind of like do these seminars that we do here uh, for them. We also do like independent seminars, which are completely free. So if anyone like kind of like uh, wants to have basic information about uh, colony management of mice or like advanced topics even like immunity and aged mice use and neuro uh, degenerative diseases and stuff and like what's what's new in the field um, those are seminars that we offer so I would go out and that's that's basically what I would do uh, on my days away like I would attend a conference I would do the seminar um, I would do in-person client meetings so like whatever I'm doing on video if there's like a person right there uh, we will go we'll do like the consultation part and um, then it it's just like it's in a different location so it's like attending a conference but also speaking at the conference but also kind of like getting more data um, but it's it's very interesting um it's super, super, like, what I like best about my job is that I get to hear all the amazing ideas that researchers have. I get to have a say and a voice in uh, all of them. And like, I don't really care about the credit part. And I think that's what, that's why it looks nice. Because for some people, it may be, well, I designed your experiment for you. But it's okay with me. Like, the consultation part is fine. Um, and like the part that I absolutely love the most is that I can ask them to do the most weirdest experiments, the most expensive things. And like, you know, the, the like, let's do this. And it's just like out of the box thinking. And I have to take no responsibility for the results. <laughs> no, um, that's amazing. That it's, it's really interesting because as I had already mentioned that it's not a very conventional role, which usually people think about um, doing, you know, like pursuing uh, while they're doing their PhD or postdoc. And, uh, but once you are in this role and as you walked us through your entire days, uh, uh, like routine, uh, that's really sounds very exciting and fascinating. So uh, uh, no, that that's something which I have learned today uh, on our conversation here because I had like really no idea what uh, um, a technical information scientist um, needs to do or what is their jo job and responsibility. So uh, no, thank you for sharing that. Um, so I think we are almost on time now, but uh, before we wrap this up, uh, Charu, if you have any thoughts for our audience, like uh, any age group who are back in India trying to pursue PhD postdoc, come to a foreign land to um, set, like, set foot into their careers they are thinking about um, from your experience for the several of years of experience which you have gathered um, if you have any tips um, for our audience that will be great yeah I think um, the most important thing that I learned was to understand that I don't know everything um, and we're all on the path of education uh, we like you may not get a degree after your PhD but you're still always learning. So I, I feel like the best sort of advice that I'd gotten from people is never assume you're the smartest person in the room, even if you are. There's always nice things to learn from everyone. And if you're open to it, you, you will learn so much more and you'll be happy about it. Like leave your ego at home. 
um if you're coming out anywhere be confident be sure of yourself do what you want but like also be conscious of other people and be conscious of their ideas um another thing like when you're coming to a foreign land it's it's very difficult to adjust so like you know kind of like prepare yourself mentally have like certain things to do and just kind of reach out to people people everywhere are generally nice if someone is not nice just forget about it and move on because it's not you it's them um but i i think like it's a continuous like i said it's a continuous learning process and if you're ready to learn and if you're open it, you know there's there's so much knowledge and so much wealth in the world um uh, and like going back to like what we discussed right in the beginning manifestation and i i will say a thousand percent it works because if you wake up every day and you say to yourself it's for example if someone wants to become a doctor i'm going to become a doctor i am going to become a doctor and nothing's going to stop me and i swear to you even when you're 60 years old you'll do the mcats if you're if you're here you'll give your mbbs neat exams if you're in india you'll become a doctor so like it'll again timing and you just have to believe it and don't be afraid of like telling people so like if you know if you want a promotion go tell your boss i want a promotion but also su substantiate it with like this is what all i did so don't ask for like empty things but you know ask for it because sometimes you just have to people don't know what you want so you just have to ask no that's that's a very very useful and um i think very useful tip uh, for everyone not just like the younger crowd or the younger generation who are like aspiring for their career but for anyone really at, old. Any, <laughs> <laughs> at any yeah exactly i mean like i also sometimes feel that i, I am growing old probably so <laughs> giving tips and you know like uh, some of my life lessons to others but but in general i think like yeah. uh, the, all the tips which you have shared are is applicable to all age groups like not just who are yeah. young at school and like just planning for their degrees further but for all of us so no uh, thank you charu and thank you for taking out time for your from your busy schedule and like talking to us walking us through your journey and uh, and we got to learn a lot of new things um, listening to your journey so thanks a lot thank you shiny this was a but this was all my pleasure and i always have time for bye patrika <laughs> yes <laughs> all right thank you Thank you.